Hi, my name is Cameron Burke, and by the end of this video, you are going to understand how to describe an acid-catalyzed nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanism. Both nucleophilic addition and elimination are covered in detail in earlier videos, so go back and review those foundation concepts if you need to. This video is specifically about acid-catalyzed nucleophilic substitution, which is what these bullet points describe. But it will be easier for you to wrap your mind around the written steps once you actually see the mechanism, so I'll come back to this later. In an earlier video about base-mediated nucleophilic acyl substitution, I talked a little bit about how positive charges didn't matter in a base-mediated reaction and you needed to follow the electrons. When you're dealing with an acid-catalyzed nucleophilic substitution reaction, the positive charges are the ones you care about. Make sure you're following the positive charges and you'll be in good shape to grasp acid-catalyzed nucleophilic acyl substitution. Generally speaking, like I said before, any nucleophilic acyl substitution has two steps, an addition and an elimination. But I like to think of acid-catalyzed nucleophilic substitution as having four distinct steps. The first step is protonation. This is when we apply our catalyst. The whole point of a catalyst is to make a reaction more likely to go forward. In an acid-catalyzed nucleophilic acyl substitution, there's an electrophilic carbonyl carbon, just like in any nucleophilic acyl substitution. But unlike in base-mediated substitution, our reactant is a primary amine and doesn't have a negative charge for the carbon to be attracted to. So unless it gets some help, the carbon is just going to keep sitting there and not reacting. Enter acid, which is going to serve as our helpful catalyst. The positive charge on hydrogen won't do anything for the carbon directly because the carbon is also slightly positive. But if you protonate this oxygen, oxygen won't have enough electrons. It's going to be positively charged, and in desperation, it's going to start pulling harder on the carbonyl carbon's electrons. While the carbonyl oxygen is sad that it has to hold on to a positive charge because it has too many bonds to it right now, and it's going to try and pull more electrons from the carbon, Carbon's going to become increasingly electrophilic in nature, meaning it's going to want more and more electrons. That's what I imagine a greedy carbon looking like. And now that our carbonyl carbon is sufficiently electrophilic, it's ready to be more reactive in order to get electrons for itself, and our reaction can go forward. So here's the big picture so far. The acid catalyst has protonated oxygen, causing oxygen to pull electrons from the carbonyl carbon, increasing its electrophilic nature. Now the reactants are all set up for step two, which is an addition. This is the first of our main nucleophilic acyl substitution steps. Even though it doesn't have a charge, this primary amine has some electrons, which is what our electrophilic carbonyl carbon is looking for. So the primary amine can attack the carbonyl carbon now. Since carbon can only hold four bonds at a time, and since our oxygen in our carbonyl group is holding a positive charge, carbon is going to break one of the double bonds with oxygen. The addition of the primary amine to the carbonyl carbon creates a tetrahedral intermediate, which looks like this. In a tetrahedral intermediate, this oxygen is happy because it has two bonds and four free electrons, and it's not carrying a positive charge anymore. But our nitrogen is unhappy because it has too many bonds and it's carrying a positive charge. In an acid-catalyzed reaction, it's easy to correct our nitrogen's problem. Since there are hydrogen ions floating around all over the place in our solution, it's going to be fairly easy for the nitrogen to take off one of these hydrogen molecules, and it'll go away and become a free proton, or it will become hydrogen gas, or whatever, whatever it does with its future. Once nitrogen kicks off a spare hydrogen, you're left with an electrically neutral tetrahedral intermediate, and you're ready to move on to step three. So step one's protonation, step two's addition, and step three is elimination. Like in every other nucleophilic acyl substitution, in your elimination step, that is when you're going to get rid of your leaving group. Here, our leaving group is this hydroxyl. So here's your tetrahedral intermediate, and here is our hydroxyl leaving group, which I'm about to get rid of. But unlike removing hydrogen from nitrogen, which is made possible because hydrogen is positive, a hydroxyl group is negative. 
and that means the carbon's gonna be hanging on pretty tight, and typically, a negatively charged molecule isn't gonna be a great leaving group. But as I said earlier, positive charges are how stuff gets done in an acid-catalyzed reaction. So we're gonna put a hydrogen on our hydroxyl group. Adding a proton to a hydroxyl group creates one of the best leaving groups in the whole world, because when you protonate an alcohol with a hydrogen, you're making water. No self-respecting H2O is going to maintain a positive charge if it doesn't have to. So oxygen's going to take its hydrogens and leave carbon by itself. Our newly protonated hydroxyl group is going to go live a new magical life as this water molecule that you see in our product. Once water's gone, carbon doesn't have enough bonds anymore. So it's going to reform its double bond that it had with the carbonyl oxygen in the beginning of our reaction. So beginning with the step two addition part of acid-catalyzed nucleophilic acyl substitution, we've really been dealing with tetrahedral intermediates. And after our leaving group is eliminated as water, that means that you've arrived at your final step, which is taking the catalyst back out of your reaction via deprotonation. So after water leaves, our carbon's down a bond, and so it's going to reform the double bond with the carbonyl oxygen. Now carbon has four bonds and it's super happy, but oxygen's carrying a positive charge. But that's okay, because just like our positively charged nitrogen earlier, oxygen can easily take electrons back from a proton when there are tons of protons floating around in our reaction. So oxygen will set our proton free, and then it will have electrons for itself Oop. and a reformed carbonyl bond. There is our carbon, and you've successfully added this amine onto your acyl group. Now that the nucleophilic acyl substitution has been complete, you've transformed your carboxylic acid into an amide. To recap, here are the bullet points I passed over earlier. For any nucleophilic acyl substitution, the general mechanism is a nucleophilic addition and an elimination. In an acid-catalyzed reaction, you protonate the carbonyl oxygen to cause it to pull electrons from the carbonyl carbon, increasing the carbonyl carbon's ability to react. The second and third steps are nucleophilic addition and elimination, just like in a base-mediated mechanism discussed in earlier videos. Finally, you have to make sure that you take the catalyst back off the product before the reaction's finished. Because this is an acid-catalyzed reaction, the positive charges are the only charges that matter. If you can keep track of the four steps, protonation, addition, elimination, and deprotonation, and remember how to follow the positive charges, you'll be able to describe an acid-catalyzed nucleophilic acyl substitution. Thanks for watching!